Okay, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we're so thankful this morning um, that the saints, your saints, your people, can come together and focus their attention on not just you, but your word which you magnify above all your name. We're thankful, Father, for the time that we have to equip ourselves uh, to be able ministers of the words of grace and uh, be effective, um, skillful at showing others who you are and why it is that you're worthy to be believed. We thank you for one another and the, the diverse ministries that folks have here in this, in this group, amazingly so. Um, we pray for those that have trouble and they w- their needs would be met spiritually uh, by the Word and the Spirit that dwelleth in them. And the same with the saints in the church and their capacity to comfort one another and exhort one another and admonish one another. Uh, we thank you for the time, and we pray that it be profitable for thee and thee alone. In the Lord Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. Okay, Proverbs chapter 9. Proverbs chapter 9. Proverbs chapter 9. Verse 9. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be yet wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. Uh, That's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at an individual in the book of John. In the book of John, a just man who increases in learning. We've studied John. We've studied the nine miracles in John. Not just eight, right? The resurrection, was that a miracle? I think so. You know, they, and you read anything and it's like eight miracles in John. Well, let's not skip that. His resurrection. And there's another, the ninth one follows the eighth one. The eighth one's the resurrection. The ninth one, you remember what that was, right? The Lord's cooking a little meal on the shoreline. Okay. And we studied that. We also studied, and it took us a while to get through it in the book of John, the, the focus of the book. Jesus Christ as the last Passover. Jesus Christ as the last Passover. You identify him as Messiah with the signs that he did and the miracles that he did. But in John, the focus is, and that's what we studied to see, he's the last Passover. Right? Remember that? Some of you might not have been here for that last message. You need that to understand that completely. And that's online. So identified as the last Passover. Now we're going to do a personal element in John, a historical, personal uh, uh, story that's in the book of John. And it concerns a just man. And if you'll turn to John chapter 3, John chapter 3. So in other words, I'm done with Mother's Day, okay? (laughs) Don't say it like that, Chuck. (laughs) Okay, John chapter 3, verse 1. Introduction, Nicodemus. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. Notice what he's called here, a ruler of the Jews. So we got a lot of information there in one verse. He's a Pharisee. I won't turn there, but Acts 23 Verses 6 and 9, they're the healthier of the two basic sects of rulers in Israel, Sadducees and Pharisees. Okay? And that verse says the Sadducees, they don't believe in the resurrection. They don't believe in angels. And they don't believe there's a spirit in men. Okay? Okay? Pharisees believe all those things. So who's the healthier bunch? What does Sadducees sound like? Highly politicized. It's as if you had conservatives, liberals. <laughs> right? And all of them 
are wanting. All of them are wanting. Um, notice what um, it says in John chapter 7, verse 1. Or wait a second. Uh, one second here. No, it's, stay at verse 2 here. So, Nicodemus is a ruler of the Jews, and if you look at um, verse 10, Jesus calls him Master. Jesus answered and said unto him, He doesn't really call him Master, he questions him as a Master, okay, a ruler. He questions that, the Lord. So you're a ruler, huh? So you're the best of the rulers. And you don't know this, and we're going to look into that. He says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? How could you rule and not know what I'm talking about to you? So he's saying to him, it's a rebuke. And you carry that name, master, ruler? Check out verse 2. There's a tell here. You know, tells are something that I use a lot. Tells. For example, if I go on a job estimate and I get three red flags, sometimes one, depending on which one it is, I won't give an estimate. Because I know that I can't afford to work real hard for others, buy material for them, and have the chance of them never being satisfied no matter what you do and not paying you. So I hear certain things and I go, that's one. <laughs> I, I don't say it out loud. I go, that's one. That's two. That's three. You're out. I got to get going. Um, I'm really, in the time frame you've got, not able to do the job. And that's the truth of it. I'm never able to do a job where I'm going to have so much trouble that I'd wish I'd never had the job. Because once I take a job, I finish it no matter what. Sometimes that hurts really bad. <laughs> I won't get into the tells, but there's a tell here. Here's the tell. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, John 3, 2. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, notice the pronouns. You want some more tells? Watch how people use pronouns. When they want to get some work done, they want you to do it, but they use a what? What kind of pronoun do they use? They don't say you. What do they say? We. <laughs> Someone wants to share responsibility for their mistake, watch the pronoun they use. Pronouns are tells. And they're usually avoidance. Pronouns are used as avoidance techniques for culpability, for responsibility. That's how sinners use pronouns, okay? Look how this guy uses, look at this pronoun. We know. Is there anything personal about that? Who's Nicodemus affiliating himself with? Who's he affiliating himself with? The rulers of Israel, which if you read this book are a bad bunch. I mean, they want to kill Jesus. And they can't get their hands on that slippery guy. But they try. When they find out Lazarus is raised from the dead and Jesus is in Bethany, a hop, skip, and jump from Jerusalem, they want to kill Lazarus because the people are coming to see not just Jesus that did the miracles, but they're coming to see Lazarus. So then they determine to kill Lazarus. Hey, this is a great bunch, isn't it? You understand the wickedness of politics, don't you? And men and their, their governance. The whole Bible's about God bringing back this universe to his rule and authority out of the hands of the wicked and the violent which take it by force. We know that thou art. So who is he? He's not a guy that identifies himself with the Lord, is he? He identifies him with a, with a bad bunch. A bad bunch. They're going after the Lord. And they don't know the scriptures. This guy doesn't. And that's what we're going to see. Uh, verse, let's, let's take a look here. Um, verse 
2 again. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, not I know, that thou art a teacher from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Well, the others aren't making that acknowledgement, but by secret at night, Nicodemus is. Remember, there's no one else that can hear this conversation except for God the Father <laughs> and the Spirit, right? Because it's a secret meeting, and it's at night. right? So it tells you something about what's going on here. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee. Twice, when you see verily, verily, mark it, note it. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, with all veracity, <laughs> I say to thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto, saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old, can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. Now, he's got personal pronouns, first-person pronouns that he's using in his discussion with Nicodemus. And we talked about this, John, remember? Then he gets to verse, then he gets to verse 7, and it changes to plural, ye. So who else is there besides Nicodemus and the Lord? So who must it be talking about? Israel. This is a ruler. He identifies himself with the nation and the rulers of that nation. He's saying the whole nation must be born again. Notice some of the things. There's all kinds of things here. Notice, he says, you can't get into the kingdom of God except you be born again. What's Nicodemus' interpretation of that? Born again. When was I born the first time? Obvious. Obvious! I was born in the womb. Obvious. And the Lord goes like this to him. No. <laughs> no, you don't understand what I'm saying. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit. Why does he add water there? What's the Great Commission? Be ye baptized and then receive what? God the Holy Spirit. That was the order. He said, now I'm not talking about going into your mother's womb. I'm talking about a spiritual birth. That is, God the Holy Spirit taking up residence in you. So what's the first birth? Why, why is he rebuked there? Well, here's, here's something that, you remember back in Chuck Colson days? Remember the, the phrase that the secular media, mainstream media picked up? He's a born again. He's a born again. And how did they understand that? Well, you were born once. They understood it this way. You were born once physically, and now you're born what? Spiritually. The world got that one, didn't they? They might not have believed it, but then they started saying, you're a born again, aren't you? It, it became a slur, a curse. And he's one of those born agains. You'll still hear it today. But back in our day, it was pop. Remember when that was hot? Jimmy Carter, remember the whole Chuck Colson thing? He was on Nixon's staff. He was the, what's the top guy? Chief of Staff. Chuck Colson. Chuck Colson, I think he died, didn't he? Just recently. And he had a prison ministry. You know, I didn't think much of his doctrine. You know, but he, did, he used what he, he had and he had a prison ministry. That's what he went into. And you know why he had a prison ministry? Because after... They went after Nixon. They put Colson in jail <laughs> as his chief of staff. Anyhow, blah 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 blah. Look at look at First uh, Peter chapter one. First Peter chapter one. First Peter chapter one. First Peter chapter one.
First Peter chapter 1. Okay, I'm going to read this to you first. Don't turn there. I'm going to read Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. I think. Let's see. Sorry about this. Okay. Exodus chapter 19. Israel comes out of Egypt. And in verse 4, the Lord says to Moses, to Egypt, to, to Israel, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings. Eagle. What's, there's four faces on the cherubim. And the four faces are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And what's John? On the four faces of the four creatures, cherubim, that are around the throne of God that Ezekiel saw. John's eagle. I bore you on eagle's wings to me. Mount Sinai, right? And he says, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagle's wings and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. That's what he tells Moses. Now look at First, uh, First Peter chapter 1. Look at verse 3. Here's born again. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us, what? Again. Unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What's he saying here? Peter's saying you have to be born again, isn't he? And Peter's saying that. What did the Lord say to Nicodemus? You've got to be born again. When was the first time you were born? See, he says lively hope. The first time they were born is when, by eagle's wings, by the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Book of John. He brought them to what? Sinai to give them what? Through a mediator. The law. If ye obey my voice. Right? And was that a lively hope? What was the law to them? Bondage. A system of bondage to show them that they were sinners. They were born out of Egypt the first time. And what's Peter saying? Now you're born unto a more lively hope, which is what? The death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and the coming of God the Holy Spirit in you. Did they get the Holy Spirit back there when they got the law? No, that was put on the flesh. What happens when stone, uh, I should say flesh, bashes itself against stone. What happens? Literally dead. Didn't they stone people in Israel? What was the law written on? See, you're born again now unto a more lively hope because what? What's the second covenant? That you're going to have the law written in the fleshy tables of your heart. See that? Born again is a reference to that nation, not us. And the fact that some say, well, in principle, we're born again. We were born once in the womb, and now we're born, right, in, in, the, in the spirit. What? Yeah, when we believe, we're born in the spirit, right? But that's exactly what Jesus is rebuking with Nicodemus, isn't he? It, Nicodemus says, are you saying that we're born in the, in the, in the womb and then... What? See, born again. It's because Nicodemus doesn't know what that means, born again. Well, how could you be a master of Israel and not know about the new covenant and the one that ushers it in? So he's rebe what I'm saying is those that are Christians that think it came from that the, the first reference to being born, that the, first of all, that it applies to us and that we were born in the 
in the womb and now we're born in the spirit. We're born in the flesh and now we're born in the spirit. True. But that's not what this is talking about. This is talking about a nation that was born out of Egypt, got the law, the old covenant, time passed, and now is looking towards what? That comes through the prophet Jeremiah, and believe me, before then. The new covenant. The new covenant. Okay? So just so we get through that, ye must be born again. Um, uh, you notice it says, uh, of the Spirit. Uh, go back to John. Go back to John. Okay, John chapter 3. Ye must be born again of the Spirit. Notice in verse 5. Except a man be born of water and of... Now notice there's no definite article in front of water. Is there? I'm not going to go into it today, but that helps you out. Believe me. That's water baptism. But there's a definite article in front of the Spirit, isn't it? And is the Spirit uppercase there? That's God. He says, ye must be born of God. Of God the Holy Spirit. On the basis of the promise God made to you of the new covenant and the one that would bring it to you because none of you are going to bring it. None of you are going to ascend, right? Descend and then ascend into heaven. That's exactly what's discussed as we keep reading the chapter. Now, something I should tell you. What's the famous, famous, famous verse that's in John chapter 3? Verse 16. Where do you see that, baby? football games because that guy with that hair. Yeah. No. You see it at Christmas on Christmas cards. Okay. Now, is it a bad verse? There's no bad verses. Is it true? Yeah, it's true. The question is, is it for us today? That's what I want to show you. I want to show you some things about John. Because John, we started out and we did a little short message, sometime we'll do a longer one, showing that John is not written in light of Pauline Revelation. Who taught that, by the way? And, I, and I'll say the name, because I admire him and I've learned a great deal because I'm, I'm a product of him. Pastor O'Hare taught that John was written in light of Pauline Revelation. The local church that I went to, first one, uh, I used to pound that down my throat all the time. <laughs> I don't think he realized what was being preached on the pulpit necessarily. <laughs> but nevertheless, because he followed Pastor over here and that was his church and he's going to go with that and that's the way it is regardless of what the Bible says. Okay. Pastor O'Hare wrote a book, Riches in Christ. If, you know, I, I won't go into it, but he's a faithful guy. Does that mean when you, when you write something down, what are you in jeopardy of? If I were to write a book, what am I in jeopardy of? Making a mistake in the book, right? Just a plain, flat-out mistake. And I, I, maybe I didn't know better, right? Then a saint come, after you write the book, though, you're going to know better. <laughs> if it's true, you're going to be aware of the mistake. Then you just say, well, I got a new version <laughs> of the book. Well, I bought the old one. I'm not buying the second one. <laughs> you know, so that, I say that just to say, you know, the book is what we need. This book, this book is what we really need. Now, here's the point here. Um, Jesus says to this guy in verse 10, you're a ruler of your people and you don't know this. It's in your scriptures. Okay? That ye must be born again as a nation. You were born once out of Egypt unto me, Mount Sinai, and you must be born again unto who? The Lord Jesus Christ, your deliverer, your Messiah. The one that ratifies with his blood a new covenant. Water baptism, great commission, and what? 
born of the Spirit. I was involved with the Navigators coming out of college, pretty prominent group. Group came out of the military. And so I got, I, I got saved in school, and then I kind of lived without, without much doctrine. I, I lived under myself for a long time and did some, some wicked things that I, had, that I later had to take care of. But nevertheless, by the time I came back home and I was with my parents, and I was staying with my parents, and I was in turmoil. I don't think they under knew it, but I was in turmoil. And I'm just sitting there one night, and a guy on the TV is talking about this empty thing in your, your life, your heart. And he's, he's got a man, and he's got a circle, and it's just void and dark and empty and vain. And I realized who I was when I heard it right away. And bang! So I looked up the guy that preached the gospel to me, the third one, at school took three. Uh, the second guy I got sick, I, I, I believed, with the second man. And he's just a guy from a local church down in mid-state Illinois in a rural community that went to a local church, preached the gospel, and I believed it. When the second guy came, I made like I didn't, didn't believe, because I wasn't sure. And he was from the Navigators. Barry Slaybog, remember him, Mom? He's at uh, Mary, and I, Mary and I's wedding. And he was with the Navigators. So then I looked him up, and he was with these Navigator apartments all around Chicagoland, and there was a leader of all the Navigator apartments, guys that were from the Navigators that, you know, I guess some of, they were saved, some of them. I hope so. And we used to do activities together. And you remember that, Mom? And I was with that bunch. And I get a job, and an engineer at the company I worked at that was leading a Bible study, I started going to it. You know what he's preaching? God, grace. God's grace. Yeah, the gospel. The gospel of grace. And I noticed the difference between what he was teaching me at work, one Thursday a week, not a lot, right, and what the navigators were teaching. You know who won out over a year's time? The guy that was giving me understanding in the Bible because all the navigators did was confuse me because what I would do is read my Bible after they taught, and I can't gel passages, and it was frightening me. <laughs> I was frightened because I couldn't put the passages together. And I thought, maybe this is a bunch of hooey. But down in my heart, I knew that I was blind, and now I see, so I'm, I'm going to go with that because it was real. And so ultimately, I started sidling <laughs> this engineer at work, Max, Max Adamski. And I said, finally, I said, what church do you go to? And it was Craig Massey's church. Let's see. So I started on the road to learn about grace. I met with the guy in charge of the Chicagoland Navigators, and these are all performers. It's funny, that group right there, um, there's some people you know that are involved with that group. Uh, Dan, some of you know Dan, right, the missionary uh, to Asia. Um, Dan? Navigator. All the navigators were high-end people. They came out of the military, and they were most of all of them were professionals. They were performers, these people. And their performance distinguished them more, I think, than them being in the Lord. And they were in the wrong program, and they didn't know what God was doing today. Well, I figured it out by studying. I'd work all day. I'd study all night until three days went by, and I had to fall asleep because I was so tired. So... Finally, I get it, and I realize the navigators are going on the basis of the Great Commission, they call it, which is what, Don? What, what are the 12 to do? When you want to read it, look, you could go through Matthew, Mark, or Luke. Look at Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Great Commission. What's the Lord say before he ascends into the heavens to the twelve? You, you guys, I'm sending out to give a renewed opportunity to Israel to believe. Go ye, therefore, and teach all nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always unto the end of the world. What's that say? Go ye therefore and teach all nations. What's the first word there? Baptizing. Baptizing. Right? Water, doesn't he say? Water and the Holy Spirit. Isn't that how the program works? You get baptized with water. It started with the baptism of John, right? But he says, the one that is coming before me, I'm not worthy to tie his shoes. Because he's going to baptize with God the Holy Spirit. What did the priest do when he entered into the priest's office? He washed with water. That's the truth of it. The sons of Aaron, they washed with water. Well, what's it say back in Exodus 19? I'm going to make you a nation of what? The whole nation's going to be priest. You need to be baptized for the work of the priesthood, right? As a nation to all nations. That's what it says in Matthew. I won't read Luke and Mark, but that's called the Great Commission. Well, I went to this guy, Ron Knauer, and he was the leader, and he's a performance guy, boy. <laughs> boy, if I didn't feel under the law in that group, you know, and he says to me, I, I say, I tried to present what God's doing today. That's, that's what I want to know. What is God doing today? Because I can't jive it with Paul's epistles in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I can't make it work. I got too many contradictions. What's the first one? When I was a kid, I prayed, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed by thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. What does that go on to say? Whosoever sins ye shall what? God will do what? Remit yours. Is that conditional blessing? If you perform, he'll forgive you. Yet we read in Ephesians 3.32 and Colossians 3.13, God forgives us. Well, how does he forgive us? Why don't you turn there? Colossians 3.13. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Is there any conditional blessing in that? Do you have to perform to get that? All you've got to do is believe to get that. I'm sorry, Ephesians 4.32. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. There's my first contradiction. Why do I know it? Because I used to pray that kingdom prayer every night. So then I read over here, there's no conditions. Whereas in that kingdom prayer, there's conditions. What is that about? I can't get an explanation from that group. So I try, to, I, I try to assemble what I understand about what God's doing today, and I present it to Ron Knauer, the head of the Navigators. Seemed legitimate thing to do. I found something wonderful. Look! Now, did I do it very well? I suppose not. I did it the best I could at the time. And you know what he said to me? This was very encouraging. He said, you don't love the church, number one. I said, yeah, I do. <laughs> and then he said, number two, he said, uh, and you're not obedient to your leaders. Number three, and you're involved with a cult. And the way you identify a cult is it's a small number, small group over here. It's not the majority. Well, even though I couldn't articulate how wrong all three of those criterion are, I was on vacation. I had a motorcycle. It's a Honda 550. And I was going on a trip out west. I shook the dust off my clothes, right? And I got on that motorcycle and went off with my heart leaping, despite what he said to me, because it held no power. You know why? The power I had now was the understanding of the Scriptures. And I'd already been through a long period of time of study and comparison, and I'm going with understanding, and I'll go with understanding every time, and so should you. Now, why did I bring all that up? The Great Commission. 
And here's what he said, Ron Knauer. I will never, ever abandon the Great Commission. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Baptize Holy Spirit. And you know what I thought when he said that to me? I saw him puff all up. You ever seen a rooster puff up? I mean, they really puff up. Like this. That's what I, that's what I saw. I thought, tut, tut. See ya. That was the end of the Navigators for me. I don't want any part of that bunch. I don't want, I don't want to quote 1 John, 1 John 1 9 anymore. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us all trespasses. Every night you're supposed to sit there and confess your sins. I didn't even grow up Catholic. I grew up Presbyterian. I don't need more religion. Okay? Now here's the thing. Is we have, people like to say, a greater commission. No. We have another commission. And it's not that one. Anybody know where it is? Yeah, and we're going to stop here. Uh, well, I was thinking, Donna, 2 Corinthians. I know what you're talk- which one you're talking about. Um, 2 Corinthians, chapter 5. I know what Don's saying. That's a good verse, too. That's a verse we had on the wall in an apartment I lived in with a bunch of grace believers that I found. Out, found. <laughs> I said, I want to move in with you guys. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter chapter 5. Verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. What are the old things? The ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ on the earth in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Henceforth we know Christ no more after the flesh. That's not how I know him. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I don't know them that way. The law was still operating then, wasn't it? The First Testament. And all the Lord does is intensifies the law to show the nation that the law is supposed to bring you to me and give you the knowledge of sin. If what you were doing for the the millennium didn't teach you the burden of sin and the need for a deliver, right? Religion. The only religion God gave. Notice it goes on to say, All things are become new, and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us unto himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given us the ministry of what? To wit, verse 19, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, the whole world. Remember the all nations back there? Well, where's that vessel? That agency of blessing now? They've fallen, and there's a new creature in a place. It's called the church, the body of Christ. And the message we preach, our commission, is the ministry of reconciliation. Not imputing their trespasses unto them. Is he counting trespasses today? And half why? Because of the gospel, what he did on the cross at Calvary, all you need to do is believe it. Hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Those words, that commission, is the ministry of reconciliation. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile, that first generation, right? And now the church, the body of Christ, is made up of all men. Who's the agency of blessing? The all men that believed and are in the church, the body of Christ, that have received God the Holy Spirit apart from water baptism. You got it? A little bit? It's not my great commission. Tut, 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 tut. Don't you love it when somebody just tries to shove something right down your throat apart from understanding? I don't like it. You know what I say? I go, I gotta go. (laughs) I gotta go. Is force something that should move you? What should move you? Proverbs 4, 7. The principal thing is wisdom. Therefore, get wisdom. And with all that getting, get what? Paul says in Colossians 2, 2, the full full assurance of understanding. You want to be fully assured? Know for sure? It says, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God. The new creature, what God's doing today. 
So, shake the dust off. Go forward. Participate with what God's doing. Tut, tut, tut. Great commission. Yeah, okay. Henceforth we know no Christ no more after the flesh. Tut, tut, tut. That was the battle I went through in my lifetime. I don't even know that it's a relevant battle today because people know so much less. <laughs> I mean, our battle, we're, our battle is, where's the Bible today? Isn't that ridiculous? It's ridiculous. We'll stop there and we'll go on with Nicodemus, okay? So we did that born again thing a little bit today, okay? I'm not saying that, you know, in principle it's not true, but certainly in John chapter 3 we see the principle, and it comes out of Nicodemus' my, mouth, and he's rebuked for it by the Lord. That is not your first birth. Your first birth is out of Egypt, unto me at Sinai. And the second birth is unto the Lord Jesus Christ, who fulfilled the law on the cross of Calvary. For you first, Israel. Father, we thank you so much for this time together. We pray each one of us would yearn to be equipped and able ministers as Paul says and, and, and is in the bulletin here um, of the New Testament, of the New Testament. And we thank you, Father, for each saint here, and we pray for their strengthening um, that comes from not just knowing, but trusting in, in the moments of life, uh, in you and the power of your grace. And we pray that grace would be with each of the saints here today. In the Lord Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen.